Revelation chapter 2 this morning. Revelation chapter 2, as we continue our series here through the book of Revelation, uh, we arrive this morning at the church at Pergamum, which I have entitled this morning, Faithful Living in a Wicked World. Faithful Living in a Wicked World. Now, as I say that, I don't want you to walk away immediately thinking that Pergamum had this figured out, because they didn't. Herein lies the problem with this church, but what we're going to find here in this passage is the instruction from the Lord to this church on how we are to do this. How is it that we live faithful in a wicked world? How is it that we live in such a way as to honor God in all that we do, in every aspect of our lives, so that we can come out, as the Scripture says, and as he writes here to each of these churches, uh, to him who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation chapter 2, in verses 12 through 17, if you found your way there, I want to invite you to stand with me. This is the word of the Lord. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faith, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who are teaching, who kept uh, teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and commit acts of immorality. So you also have some in the same way hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. You can be seated this morning. As I said, this letter is being written here to a church with the ultimate aspect of being God teaching them on how to live faithful in a wicked world. Now, I want you to notice here just immediately before we even get into the text, you'll notice a couple things as we read through that passage. There were some things that this church was doing well. They were holding fast the name of Christ. They were not denying the faith. But false teaching had crept into the church. And this is the issue that Jesus is using here as he writes this letter through John to address and to point out to this church. Now, it's important for us to understand a little bit about this city. Uh, Pergamum was a city who was north of Smyrna. You remember, if we go back to the introduction of this book, this letter traveled in a a, a north and then an easterly and then a southern direction, almost like a horseshoe shape. So now it's arrived here in the city of Pergamum. Now, Pergamum did not have the the focus or the empire of commerce that the other previous two had had, but was still considered one of the most premier cities in Asia Minor due to its focus on education, on science, and on medicine. Inside the city of Pergamum was a massive library of some 200,000 volumes, which was second only in size to the library in Alexandria, Egypt. It was such a desirable city because of its knowledge and and, uh, the library there that many kings had made their royal residence there in this city. Now, outside of the learning that was occurring there and the education that was happening there, Pergamum was also a very evil and wicked city. Uh, Here in the city of Pergamum was the uh, was the temple of Ascali- Asclepius, uh, whose symbol was the wreathed serpent. Uh, it was a, a, a god associated with the practice of early medicine. And so this name, Asclepius, meant savior. And so the symbol was a serpent. And so because he was considered a god of healing, many would travel here to Pergamum with a desire to be healed there. So there were all these people come into this city, and especially to this one specific temple, because they thought that this god, this serpent god, who they called Savior, would heal them. Also in this city, there were temples to gods of Athena, Dionysus, and Zeus. And so it was a a city very much focused on pagan practices. 
But it was also a city that was filled uh, with Romans, filled with those who um, were allegiant to the empire of Rome. So it was a very difficult place for a church to find itself, a very challenging place to be able to worship God and to glorify Christ in the midst of such wickedness and idolatry. The first thing I want you to notice in this passage though this morning is the picture of Jesus that we find here. In verse 12 it says, And to the angel of the church of Pergamum write, The one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this. As we've seen previously in the other letters, John paints here a picture of Jesus from biblical language in a way that specifically applies to the situation that the church is facing. And this church is facing false teaching inside the church. So how is John portraying Jesus? How is Jesus really presenting himself to John as he writes this letter to this church? He presents himself as the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. Well, what is that sharp two-edged sword? Well, we know this from the Scriptures, that the sharp two-edged sword symbolizes the Word of God, the truth of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, "...for the Word of God is living and active." and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Because see, the thing that false teaching needs to be confronted with is the word of truth. And God's word is truth, and it cuts, and it cuts two ways. That's why this word, um, the Scripture describes the word of God as a a two-edged sword, because it has the ability to cut both ways. We talked about this a few weeks ago when we actually preached through this passage here in Hebrews. But it has the ability to cut one way to bring healing and to bring correction to the believer, but it also has the other way to be able to cut to the quick those who are condemned before the Lord and to cut and to expose sinfulness. One commentator put it this way, that the sword of the, of the Word of God is a sword of salvation as well as a sword of death. I love the way Matthew Henry put it. He says, the Word of God is a sword. It is a weapon both offensive and defensive. It is in the hand of God able to slay both sin and sinners. There is an edge to make a wound and an edge to open up a wound in order for its healing. There's no escaping the edge of this sword. If you turn aside to the right hand, it has an edge on that side. If on the left hand, you fall upon the edge of the sword on that side, it turns every way. It's a picture of the authority of the Word of God and the power of the Word of God. This was important to remind the church here at Pergamon because from understanding, they're living in a Roman-controlled city. And the Romans demanded complete allegiance of all of its citizens. Now, we think that the government may have high demands on us today as citizens in the place we live. We have no conceptualization of the demands that the Romans placed upon its citizens. You were expected to say, Caesar is Lord. And you were expected to not just say it, but to mean it. You were expected to declare your allegiance to the Roman Empire in every shape, form, and facet of your life. And they wielded the sword with vengeance. If you would not bow the knee to the emperor, if you would not bow the knee to the empire, then you would lose your own life. But here in describing himself as this sword, this sword which cuts, this sword which has power, this sword which has authority, Jesus is highlighting the fact for this church that they did not need to fear the sword of Rome. Instead, the sword of Rome needed to fear the sword of Christ. The Romans and the power that they had had been given to them by only one source, not their military forays, not their own strength, but their power had been given to them by God. And the true ultimate power in the world we know and understand belongs not to the Roman Empire, not to any worldly government, but true power and authority in this world belongs solely to Jesus Christ. Remember what he told his disciples there in Matthew chapter 28, all power and authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So Jesus here is pictured as the one who has this sharp two-edged sword. It's a sword of power, it's a sword of authority, it's a sword of truth. And with the emphasis there on this idea of truth, God's Word is living and active, Hebrews tells us, sharper than any two-edged sword. Truth matters. Truth matters to the local church. Truth matters to us as Christians. And truth matters to a lost world. 
Because if what we are preaching and teaching and proclaiming is not the true Word of God, then it offers no hope to lost people. If what we are proclaiming is not the truth, it is not this two-edged sword, it offers no correction for the Christian in times of, 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 of disobedience, and it offers no power to cut open the soul and to bring the balm of Christ to a wicked heart. Secondly, notice here something about the church of Pergamum, that it was a steadfast church. Notice what it says there in verse 13, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. As he does in other letters, Jesus begins here with a compliment for the church. They were doing very well in a very important regard, and that was their steadfast faithfulness. Jesus describes where they are, and He knows. We've talked about this before in the previous churches that we looked at, the fact that Jesus is watching and understands what's happening inside of the churches. This brings an encouragement to us. Jesus says, I know where you dwell. I know what's going on in your life. Brothers and sisters, take great hope in the knowledge that Jesus has of us. Take hope in the knowledge that Jesus has of, of the church at Barberville, that He knows what's going on in our lives. He knows what's going on in our situation. And He says, I know where you dwell. I know the city. I know what's happening there. And notice the emphasis that is put there. It says where Satan's throne is. And then notice there at the end, it says where Satan dwells. This is a highlighting of the fact of the great wickedness inside this city. By describing this city as a place where Satan dwells and where Satan's throne is, what is being highlighted here is Satan's seeming control and power over this city through the pagan practices that were being committed there. The city is a place that is under the stronghold of Satan's power. But brothers and sisters, we understand that Satan does not have complete authoritative power as God does. But we also understand that he does have power that he uses as he fights against God and he fights against the church in this world. Remember the words of Jesus, excuse me, the words of Satan to Jesus when he took him out into the wilderness and Satan took him up on that very high mountain and he told him all these things, all these kingdoms of the world and their glory I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Now, what was Satan describing there? Satan is not describing his all-supreme power, but what he's describing is the fact that he had influence over kingdoms of the world. He had influence over kings and excuse me, rulers and leaders. And so he's, he's offering here to Jesus this temptation, well, if you'll follow after me, I'll give you this great power and authority. Paul in 2 Corinthians tells us, as he describes... Satan, he says, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan uses what power he has to grab as much as he can control. And we see throughout the Scripture that there are times and places where it seems that because of the wickedness and the idolatry of a certain place or a certain city, that it seems to be a stronghold of Satan. And here we find this in the city of Pergamum. Satan has levied sway over this town because of their wickedness. It was no doubt a spiritually challenging place to call home as a believer in Jesus Christ. In a city surrounded by pagan temples and idolatrous practice and wickedness on every front, it was a challenging place to live. Matthew Henry pointed out that there's such a great encouragement here that the Lord makes note not only of the places that we have and opportunities that we have where we live for good, but He also notices the temptations and discouragements that we meet with where we are and that He makes allowances for us in that. God gives us the strength. Jesus here is noting the success of the church at Pergamum, and He's complimenting it on them. And He has been providing for them and carrying them through. 
Because the strength that Jesus points out here for this church and the things that they have done well is not because they have done it on their own, but they have done it because he has sustained them through it. Because notice this, despite this challenging setting, can you imagine that the city where you live is described as the place where Satan lives and where Satan has his throne? That tells us of the stronghold that Satan had over this town. But despite all of that, despite how evil and wicked this city was, notice what Jesus says to them. He says, you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas. They held fast his name. What this means is that they were not ashamed to be numbered alongside of him. They were not ashamed of the name Christian. As people in this city were going about their pagan practices and doing what they wanted to do, the believers in this church were not ashamed to be numbered amongst the name of the disciples and the apostles and the church of Jesus Christ. They held fast to his name. They considered it an honor. We've talked in in sermons in the past about the idea of what names mean. And, And anymore, people don't really put a lot of, of credence or credibility on, on someone's last name. But there were periods of time in America and especially in periods of time around the world where your name really specifically meant something. In some places, it meant what kind of job or occupation you were going to have. And in other places, it meant how you were received in society. If you had a certain name, you were ostracized. And if you had a different name, you might have been elevated up because of your family lineage and your history. And we don't think a lot about that today. But here, Jesus is pointing this out, that these believers were proud and honored and held fast to the name of Jesus Christ. These Christians were no doubt suffering, as they were in other cities, in the midst of this persecution, that they were losing their jobs, losing their livelihoods, losing their families. And all it would have taken for any of them to have gotten those things back was to just deny the name of Jesus. All they would have to say is, oh, I no longer associate my name with that man. I no longer hold the name Christian. Now, we've heard people in the past say, well, listen, what an, what an easy thing this would be, right? You don't really have to mean it. You just say it. Right? You don't really have to mean it in your heart. You can, you can just deny him with your, with your mouth and, and still hold on to him. But brothers and sisters, we can't do that. We can't deny him with our mouth and still hold to him in our heart. And these believers understood that in the face of such severe hostility and evilness and wickedness, as simple as it might have seemed to just say, well, I'll just deny him so I can keep these things that I want. No, they understood it doesn't work that way. They had to hold fast to the name of Jesus. And notice, secondly, he says, not only were they holding fast to his name, but they did not deny his faith. They had not denied the core doctrines of the faith. Justification in Christ alone. The atoning sacrifice of Christ. They had not veered from those core doctrines which had saved them. Now, it's interesting because in just a moment, we're going to look at some things that were incorrect in the church. But I want you to notice here that it was not the core doctrine of the truth. It was not that saving faith, even though threatened with death, they did not turn their back on Christ. And Jesus points this out by highlighting one particular member of their church, Antipas whose name actually means against all, who had made the ultimate sacrifice of his own life for the faith. I love that name, Antipas, against all, because, brothers and sisters, we understand that as Christians, this is what we are in the world. We are fighting against all the powers and the forces of evilness and wickedness in this world. Now, we don't know anything about this person. We don't know anything about Antipas besides the fact that he had laid down his life for the faith. Now, what we can draw from this fact is that Jesus uses as an example that his faith was so strong and resolute that Jesus saw him as a great example of one who is faithful to the very end. Jesus describes him as my witness, 
Remember that word witness is the word martyr, my word, my martyr, my witness, my faithful one. Jesus is highlighting here for this church that they had done well. In the face of opposition, in the face of persecution, they remained true to the faith. But despite all that, there were some serious issues present inside of this church. I want you to notice thirdly that this was a compromising church. Verse 14 and 15. He says, but I have a few things against you. Because you have there some who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Here at the church at Pergamum, we find another problematic issue that is so dangerous that Jesus notes it again as something that he has against them. As we talked about with the church at Ephesus, what a wake-up call this would be for a church, right? To, to receive this letter from the Lord and to, for him to start out with the good things that you're doing, but all of a sudden he makes this swift correction, but there's some problems. I have a few things against you. Now, what was happening here at the church of Pergamon had been described by the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20. He says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Jesus highlights two errant doctrines here in this patch is first, the teaching of Balaam, and second, the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, the teaching of Balaam is based on that story that we see there in Numbers chapter 22 through 25 and also mentioned in Numbers 31. The highlight of that story is that King Balak had called Balaam in in order to try to figure out how he could defeat the nation of Israel. And as Balaam sought to be able to do this, he, he finally figured out the only way that they could cause Israel to sin was to introduce them to compromise. And that compromise came about through intermarriage with heathen women, through idolatry, and through immorality. That idolatry was eating those things that were sacrificed to idols. In other words, what Balaam was doing was introducing compromise against the Word of God with the things of the world that had been forbidden by God. The Apostle Peter warned that such a group of people would arise. Second Peter chapter 2, he says, Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now, Balaam was doing all of this for money. Now, he was doing this because he was being well paid by the king. Nothing in this text tells us whether those here in Pergamum were doing it for the same reason. But what we do understand was that the doctrine both of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was one that introduced compromise into the church in saying that you don't really have to follow God's commands when it comes to immorality and idolatry. Now, in the church at Ephesus, uh, the Lord had commended them because they hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. But what we find here in Pergamon is not only was it being tolerated, but it was even being practiced by some of those inside the church. The teachings of Balaam and the Nicolaitans are one and the same. They're grounded in antinomianism. Antinomianism encourages those involved with it, to live with freedom in the wicked practices of the world. Antinomianism teaches that because someone is in Christ, that they're no longer under the law. But they're teaching it, and we understand we're, we're not under the law in the sense of its judgment on us anymore, but the antinomianism teaches that in their, their perspective of not being under the law, that that means that you can do whatever you want without consequence which stands in complete opposition to the biblical teaching about sanctification and holy living. 
Antinomianism taught, the Nicolaitans and the teachings of Balaam taught, that under this freedom, these Christians could live as they wanted, even through wicked immorality and idolatry, and still not be in sin. And my friends, this morning, the teaching of antinomianism still exists in the world today. Now, it's not called as such. We don't call it the doctrine of Balaam or the doctrine of the Nicolaitans anymore. It goes by a lot of different names now. One of those would be the teachings of hypergrace. There are several teachers out there today that teach, you know, that God's grace is so big that we really don't need to pray for forgiveness. We don't need to pray for repentance. We can really live our lives however we want as Christians. As long as we're in Christ, we live whatever and does what makes us happy. And as long as we're in Christ, we can live however we want. There's no need to pray for forgiveness, no need to pray for repentance. Satan has no new false doctrine. He just modifies it a little bit for the current cultural situations. Every generation sees a rise of antinomianism in it in one shape, form, or fashion. But the shocking thing is here, we, we understand that false teachers are going to arise. We understand that the pure of gospel of truth is going to be tainted and twisted in some way in, in order to, to create a false gospel. But the shocking thing here for the church of Pergamum was that this immorality, this compromise with idolatry, were actually being carried out by some of the members of the church. And even amongst those who were not practicing it inside the church, they were tolerating those in the church who were practicing it. The danger of compromise is not an isolated issue for the church at Pergamum. Remember that although these letters were written to particular churches in particular situations, they carry a message to churches of every age of the dangers and the situations that we will find ourselves in. Compromise with the world, compromise with sin, is a danger for every church in every generation, especially those who find themselves present in a society of success, plenty, and leisure. Compromise with the world is not as great of a temptation in a place where there's not vast abundance and leisure, and pleasure. But as we look around us in the world today, we see that we live in a time, not just in America, but really almost around the world, where people are doing fairly well for themselves. Leisurely activities are at an all-time high. We find more time to do silly, non-important things now, I think, that we probably have at any point in history. And so there's this danger that we compromise because, let me, let me take just a moment for just a second. I just had read this last night and it ties in so perfectly well. As a culture continues to grow in success and plenty and things are going well and, and societies continue to grow, the danger for compromise continues to arise because there is this complacent place that we find ourselves in. We begin to get comfortable, right? We, we, we get comfortable and, and we get to this place where we don't want the, the, the waters to be stirred or the boat to be overturned. And so we'll begin to see even those who had firm resolve in the faith begin to veer because of the pull and the sway of the society at large. Because once we find ourselves at ease in a culture, we begin to allow ourselves to be pushed and prodded and motivated in the way that that culture continues to go. Now, I apologize that I can't remember the specific name and I can find it out for you, but last night, Someone that I've, I follow posted an article about a Christian professor who years ago had, had written what was really the, the seminal work on the Christian response to LGBT issues and the biblical response of how the church is to handle those things. And his work had been 
had been promoted and used for, for almost a decade, I think, as, this, as, a perfect, as one of the best biblical examples on how to handle those issues. Well, it just came out yesterday that this same man is publishing a new book that comes out this fall where he completely capitulates on all of that and moves away from a biblical perspective on those issues to now being an open and accepting of the LBGT issues and community. Compromise. This is why the Lord is so adamant here about what's happening in this church. Because we have to be continually on the lookout for compromise in our lives. It wasn't that the church at Pergamum just woke up one morning and everyone just decided, hey guys, Yesterday, we were standing for truth in these issues, and we understood that we should not commit immorality, and we should not be mixed with idolatry, but today, every one of us are going to start doing it. No, it happens progressively. It happens slowly. And how does it happen? Well, it happens because it begins to creep into the church, and no one does anything about it. It happens because it begins to creep into the church, and no one is willing to confront each other about it. As a church, we are made up of individual Christian lives. The church is us, the people gathered in this room. We are the church. And we must be continually on the lookout for compromise in our own lives first, but we must also be on the lookout for compromise in the lives of each other. We must be willing to first correct ourselves And we must be willing to lovingly correct others. And let me emphasize this. We must be willing to receive correction from those who we know love us. That's what it means to be the church of Jesus Christ. In this room, we are a family this morning. And so if we see issues in each other, we should have the love to go to each other and to offer that loving rebuke and correction but then we also have to be humble enough to receive that correction. Let me emphasize this for a moment. All of us, elders included, should be willing to hear correction from our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and be willing to evaluate to see whether that correction is true or not. And if it's true, we must be willing to make the necessary changes. What happened to the church of Pergam is that they had not dealt with compromise that had begun to creep in. And so it spread. It spread like a cancer inside of the church. Remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians? Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so you may have a new lump, right? It didn't take much. It doesn't take much leaven to leaven the whole lump. And so when compromise begins to creep in, if it's not dealt with, it will spread to the entirety of the church as it had done here at Pergamum. So what's the proper response? Well, notice here, fourthly, the command of Jesus. He says, therefore, repent or else I'm coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. What we will notice in the Scriptures is that Jesus and the apostles never mince words when it comes to the truth of God's Word and to the truth of the church. He calls the leaders of the church. Now remember, this letter is written specifically first to the angel or the pastor of the church at Pergamum, but it's also written to the members there. So he's calling to them to swiftly deal with the problems that he's identified. He says, therefore, repent. He says, I pointed out there are some of you who are holding to the teaching of Balaam, some holding to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. So if he's going to call them to repent, what does this entail? What what do they need to do? Well, first, obviously, is to repent. They have to recognize this error. They have to recognize this compromise and turn from it. This sin that was happening inside of the church was a serious issue, and it must be dealt with. Even though not all of them in the church were actively sinning by compromise, they were all guilty because even if they weren't actively sinning through compromise, they were being complacent to the ones who were. Matthew Henry said this, To continue in communion with persons of corrupt principles and practice is displeasing to God. 
draws a guilt and blemish upon the whole society, and they become partakers of other men's sins. Brothers and sisters, inside the church, if we overlook the clear sin of others and allow them to continue to do that and do not confront them and do not challenge them and still continue to support them in their sin, then we obtain guilt in our own lives for the sins of those people. Because we are not doing what God has called us to do. And through our lack of confrontation, what we're doing is we're telling that other person, it's okay, you just keep doing it. And even in our own heart, we're saying the same thing. There had to be a corporate repentance at this church because there had been corporate sin. So number one, they had to repent. They had to turn from their error and reconcile themselves with Christ. But secondly, in order to deal with this, they understand there's going to have to be some correction that happens. They're going to have to go to these people, and they're going to have to bring these matters to the table. Titus chapter 1, it says, For this reason, reprove them severely, so they may be sound in the faith. Paul would write to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 5, Those who continue in sin, rebuke in the presence of all, so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. So many times, churches are afraid to confront sin because they fear the consequences of what might happen. Interestingly enough, they don't fear the consequences of God. They fear the consequences of men. Well, if we confront this sin, this family might get mad, and they give a lot of money, and they might leave the church. If we confront this sin, some people in the church might get upset, and they might leave the church. If we confront this sin, and, and people hear about it, that they're going to point at our church, and they say, well, you know, what are, those, what are those people doing over there? Look at how judgmental they are. And what you end up seeing is you see churches that end up suffering for decade upon decade upon decade because sin has not been confronted in the church. The Scripture makes it clear. If we love God and if we love each other, we will confront the sin in our lives and in the lives of each other. So correction had to happen. But also discipline had to happen. Matthew chapter 18 lays out the practice of church discipline to us. Because no doubt, because of what had happened here, no doubt that there would be some of those, even as this correction began to happen, would not turn away. They they had, had, had given themselves so wholly over to this compromise that they were not going to turn back away from it. So there's going to be a necessary correction that's going to have to be given, but ultimately there's going to have to be the willingness to go even to the furthest level of correction and have discipline inside of the church here at Pergamum. They're going to have to deal with it. And this is a serious issue, brothers and sisters, because notice what Jesus says. He says, therefore repent or else I am coming to you quickly. So the fourth element we see of this repentance that is necessary is that it must be done swiftly. There is no time for delay here in dealing with this. Because Jesus says, if you don't do it, I'm going to come to you quickly and I'm going to handle it. False doctrine is not a thing to be trifled with. Jesus says that judgment is going to come quickly or swiftly through him. So he's pointing out the fact you've got to deal with this and you've got to deal with it now. There's a great temptation. And inside of churches, and I can speak from from a leadership perspective of having been involved in different churches, there's a great temptation when something begins to arise. Human nature says, well, let's just wait and see what happens. Right? Maybe it's not as bad as we think it is. You know, maybe we just misunderstood. But no, Jesus says you've got to deal with it quickly. There's got to be a swiftness involved in this. And he says, if you refuse to repent, I will make war against him with the sword of my mouth. Jesus is not referring here to the second coming, because obviously that doesn't make sense in, in the context of the passage. But he's telling them that if they're not willing to deal with it, he is going to come and through the power of his word and through the truth and the authority, he is going to deal with the compromise in the church. Judgment is going to fall upon the church at Pergamum. 
So Jesus deals with the issues. He has commended them for their faithfulness in standing true and not denying his name. He has exposed the sin of the church in compromise. He has called them to repent and called them to this place of turning from those things in order to escape judgment. But I want you to notice finally here the promise of Jesus. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give him some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. Jesus describes to that one who overcomes a a threefold promise. But what are they overcoming here? They're overcoming the world and this refusing, uh, this, this compromise by obedience to Christ. They're overcoming. And in each place we see a problem that is presented, a difficulty that is presented, and then we see this call to overcome. Now, ultimately, they're going to overcome life or overcome death with, through Jesus Christ. But even here, he's talking about the overcoming of that compromise that was present here in the church. To him who follows after me, to him who's obedient to me, to him who follows after me and does not fall prey to this compromise, does not fall prey to this false doctrine. There's three things that are promised here. Number one is hidden manna. Now, in the, books of Ex- excuse me, in the book of Exodus, we find the story of how God provided food for the nation of Israel in the wilderness. As they would awake each morning, they would find manna on the ground for them to eat. And you remember, they were only allowed to pick up what they needed for the day. They could not collect extra. It was a demonstration of God's provision and His faithful provision for His people that He would give them what they needed each day. It was His faithfulness, His covenant promise to them. And in the midst of the wilderness, God continually provided that physical nourishment that his people needed to survive. Here in this hidden manna, here in in the church of Pergamon, we find a picture of Jesus himself, who is the spiritual nourishment that God has given to his new covenant people. It's described as hidden manna because it's not a nourishment that is available to all, but is only available to those who find themselves in Christ. Colossians chapter 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also be revealed with him in glory. Jesus is the spiritual nourishment that our soul needs. And he has promised if we are hidden in him, he gives us of this hidden manna, this hidden nourishment that we need each and every day. We are able to live out our lives and to do the things that we're called to do because we are being continually spiritually nourished by Jesus each and every day. He is our bread from heaven. Secondly, it says, I will give them a white stone. Now, commentators are really at a vast variance when it comes to the meaning of this white stone. I'll, I'll give a few to you this morning because I think you can see where they all kind of point back to the same picture. Some say that the white stone is the stone of acquittal. There was a practice in this time where a judge uh, would hand an accused criminal either a black stone or a white stone. The black stone meaning condemnation and the white stone meaning that they had been acquitted and can go free. Some point to the idea of the stone that was given to the competitors in the Greek games. And as they're out competing in this various Olympic events, they would be given a stone. And then at the end of the match, they would go back and they would take that stone and give that, uh, turn that in to receive their actual prize. Some say it refers to a practice that was actually inside the city here at Pergamum where these white stones were used as a somewhat of a ticket or an admission pass to different functions in the city and the temples and such. And so it was like this idea that only you could get in if only if you had this white stone. All of them are really kind of pointing to the same concept and idea of a marking out of one among others of a demonstration of someone being separated out or pulled out or recognized as being different. And so in Christ, we have been given this white stone. We know that we have been acquitted, that our our lives no longer are being judged for our sinfulness because we are in Christ. We've received the white stone of acquittal. We've received the white stone of the prize because we know that at the end of our life, we have forgiveness of sin and everlasting life with him. (laughs) 
receive the white stone of an admission pass because we know that it is only through Christ that we have everlasting life in heaven with Him. I, I believe all three are, are worthwhile examples, but really the focus of our interpretation is not specifically on the stone itself, but what Jesus says is that there's a new name written on that stone. In the Old Testament, the high priest in the temple wore a breastplate with 12 stones on it. And on each stone was the name of one of the tribes of Israel. It was a recognition of God's care and His watching over them. And in the New Testament, believers have been given a new name and a new identity in Christ. Because of who we are, we are a new creation in Him. We see this idea repeated later on in the book of Revelation. In just a couple of chapters, in Revelation chapter 3, it says, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write him on, write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes out of heaven, and my new name. David Chilton points to this concept of this new name by saying this, quote, The meaning of this expression rooted in a Hebrew idiom, is that the name is known by the receiver in the sense of owning it. In other words, the point is not that the name is secret, but that it is exclusive. Only the overcomer possesses the name, the divinely ordained definition of himself as belonging to the covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. No one else has the right to it. We have a new name that has been given to us in Christ. We possess that name because it has been given to us, and no one else has that name unless they are in Jesus Christ. The picture of what Jesus is describing here is that these false teachers, although they may claim to have Christ in their lives, are not truly Christian because they don't have this new name in Christ. They have not received it from Him. Jesus here is pointing out that to those inside the church who would overcome this false doctrine, overcome this compromise, he reminds them of this promise of his continual provision for them on a daily basis. He promises them of their forgiveness that's available through him, of what he has done on their behalf. And he promises of this relationship, this new name that he's given to them, which separates them out from every other person in the world, and it promises them this glorious good news of His care for them. Brothers and sisters, compromise with the world is an ever-present danger for the church. Even a church like Pergamum, who had stood so steadfast in the face of danger and persecution, They had not denied clinging to the name of Christ. They had not denied him when it came to the face of being even put to death like Antipas was. And we must never allow ourselves to be convinced that just because we are faithful in one area that we cannot find ourselves failing in another. Pergamum serves as a stark example of this. Satan is always seeking to find a way to bring a church to compromise. And we must always be on the lookout against it. That we would remain faithful to the one who remains faithful to us. That we would remain true to the one who is that word of truth. And that we would stand firm in the face of compromise. Father, this morning we thank you Lord, we thank you that your word is a word of truth that cuts. We thank you as we see here that you provide for the church in the midst of difficulty. Lord, the ability to stand firm and to be resolved.
And Father, we pray that we would never allow our hearts to begin to be drawn into compromise with the world. Lord, what a striking warning you gave to this church of the dangers of compromise, of the dangers of of allowing our guard to drop when it comes to sinfulness and disobedience to you. That it is not some trivial matter that can be overlooked, but is a matter that's such that you promised that if it was not dealt with, Lord, you were going to come and deal with it yourself. Lord, help us first to examine our own hearts in areas where we may find compromise in ourselves. Father, areas where we are softened against sin and against wickedness, whether it be by the influence of the world, whether it be by the influence of friends, whether it be, Father, just by our own laziness. Help us, Lord, to see those areas in our life and to deal with them quickly. And Lord, help us as a church that as we love one another, that we would be continually helping one another. That we would all stand firm, all stand strong upon the truth of your word and never falter when it comes to these matters. Lord, guide and direct our hearts this morning as we come to the table. Lord, may we Recall and remember what Christ has done on our behalf. May we recall that through His death and His resurrection, or that we know today who we are in Him, that we have that hidden manna, that we have that nourishment for our soul, we have that forgiveness. And that, Father, you have given us a name that you call us by as your children. And we ask all these things this morning.